stories that are untold, underreported, and all out inspirational. Carrie Pena reports. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Pena. Thank you so much for listening to Carrie Pena Reports on iTunes and Stitcher and for watching our shows on Facebook and YouTube. You can always find us online at inspiredmedia360.com. On this podcast, we like to interview people who have highly inspirational stories to share. In studio with us today is Tanya Wheelis, who left a really big deal job and it turned out pretty well. I love stories like yours, and there's so much to talk about uh, with your journey. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Carrie. So we'll talk about how, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, but how you kind of crashed and burned. Yeah, sure. But what has happened since then has brought you such greater happiness. Absolutely. And it's framed your entire philosophy for your company. Mm -hmm. Tell us first a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I'm an Arizona native. I've lived here my whole life. Um, Went to law school thinking that that's what I wanted to do. Um, Did it for about three years, which was awesome, and then got the opportunity to go work for one of my clients. And so I became the CEO of the Arizona Bankers Association, which was a ton of lobbying, media, um, and really just kind of shaking hands and being social. So it was really great. And then in 2008, the financial crisis hit. And so it became a really stressful time Um, for the industry. Certainly the demands on my time were even more and uh, had a young son, family. And that's really when it was in that period that I kind of had my oh no moment. Um, And then since then, went on to work with the Phoenix Suns. I was a senior vice president there, which was awesome. And yes, it is as great as everyone says it is. and uh, But that's where I found my passion, was there. I did player development. I worked with the players on their off-court development. So how do you handle the stresses of life, family, um, building your brand? But I also got to mentor a lot of the younger people there. And that's where I realized my passion lied in helping others succeed. And that was kind of the jumping off point for what I'm doing now. So when um, you emailed me prior to the interview mm-hmm. and I asked you uh, what was a breaking point for you Uh, when you needed, you knew that life had to change. And you say, I was on a regular run and part of the way through, you realized that tears were streaming down your face. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the first time, but this time you say that you decided enough. I had everything I thought I ever wanted and still felt, felt sad, alone and unhappy. I didn't know why, but I knew there had to be a better way. Yeah, it was, you know, I think like a lot of women, certainly a lot of women I've worked with, um, we get so focused on just keeping all the balls in the air, you know, and I had been that way. I And I had everything that I loved. I had a great family. I had a great job, a beautiful home, healthy. Um, everyone was healthy, right? And I think so many of us can relate. We think that crisis comes when you get a diagnosis or you lose your home. And I think the reality is, and certainly what I felt, was no, life looked pretty good from the outside and it was still crushing me inside. And I think the hardest part, Carrie, was that um, I kept a smile on my face the whole time, right? Because I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want anyone to know that I felt like I was failing everywhere. I didn't want people to know that I had all of this stuff and what a brat to not feel, you know, I should be on cloud nine. Um, so it was, a, it was a tough time. Emotionally, what do you think you were crying over? What was missing? Oh, um, I mean, that's a good question. That's what I've spent a lot of time. I think, frankly, I don't know that things were missing. Um, that's sort of the conclusion I came to. The problem was I wasn't seeing the blessings that were right in front of me. And I think we bring, as adults, we bring a lot of baggage into our life, right? And so there was certainly a lot of um, family healing, you know, issues that I had had with my father and others and, you know, that I was kind of bringing into my relationships. But if you asked me now what's different today versus that moment when I was crying, I would tell you not a lot. I'm in the same house with the same husband, with the same kids, different job. What has changed is me. And that was really the aha moment for me on my journey was we don't have to go eat, love, pray. We don't have to do all all of these really big things. Um, 
we can just make small changes in ourselves and little by little that opens up the beauty, the happiness, the peace that is right there waiting for us. And I'm excited to hear you kind of lay out what you've done and how you've done it. Um, But first, I do want to dig a little deeper into the point that you just made, because I think it, it translates to how a lot of people, not just women, but how a lot of people feel. And that is, I worked so hard. Now I have this job and I have this house and I have this life. Why am I not happy? Yeah. It's a hard question to answer. It is super hard. And it's one that we don't talk about a lot, right? We don't talk about what do you do when you have it all or whatever you thought it was and you don't feel good. And I think for me, a lot of it was self-worth, right? It was about being kinder and gentler to myself. It was about letting um, go of the control I wanted to have. You know, I grew up in a very volatile home where things always felt out of control. And so the way I coped with that in my adult life was to try and control everything, right? If I had the schedule, if I did it just right, if I could get him to do that and her to act, and it's too much. We can't control other people. And so that leads to dissatisfaction and unhappiness and contributes to this story we're already telling ourselves about I'm not enough, I'm messing up, um, you know, for a lot of women, I'm going to be found out, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, how did I get here? The imposter. Yes, total imposter complex. And we're our own worst critics, you know? And so, so yeah, it's a hard place to be and to look yourself in the face and to say, okay, what am I going to do different? You know, the moment you realize you can't make anyone else do anything different, then you got to turn the finger back at yourself. Did you feel that because you're obviously so smart and together, and like you said, you had this aspect of wanting to control mm-hmm. and make everything really great. And you strike me as someone who, when you go in to do something, you're going to do it well, <laughs> yeah. going to do it really well. But did you keep moving the goalpost on yourself? So, you know, you get this and you get here and then it still doesn't feel like enough. And then what's the end game? Absolutely. And the, the, the short answer is there is no end game. When you're living life that way, always moving the finish line, there is no end. It will never be enough. And for me and for a lot of clients that I've worked with, we're trying to fill a hole. That's really what we're doing, right? We keep, because if I do this, then it's going to mean I'm good enough. If I do this, they're gonna notice me. If I do this, it will mean I'm worthy of what I don't know, right? And so we set these goals for ourselves. I'm a total type A achiever. And then you get there and you're right. You're like, God, well, I'm I'm still me. Yeah. (laughs) I'm still here, right? (laughs) And so and so that's part of it is is just being great with now, right? Being happy where you are, noticing the greatness that surrounds you, because let's face it, there might not be a tomorrow. Whatever that next goalpost that you've set, you may not ever get there, right? And so it's kind of a losing game. I always talk about um, at that point in my life when I felt really, um, really unhappy, it was like a hamster running on a wheel. And I'd gotten on that wheel Um, starting in, you know, frankly, college and then law school, where it was like, I just ran and ran and I wasn't going to let anyone outrun me. Right. But I couldn't quite tell you why I was running anymore (laughs) or what the destination was. Yes. And it's all, and you know, the thing about the run, and I think a lot of people feel this way, you know, whether it's on your yoga mat or running, that's usually a very personal time when we feel alone. Or if you um, do like uh, cycling, you know, you're in a dark room you can finally let your guard down, right? You're not, there's no one staring at you looking across from you. And I think that need to keep a facade up only adds to our discontent. And so to just have that release of tears, it's like, that's when you have to just get honest with yourself. Like, where am I? What am I doing? Because, you know, one of my like fundamental beliefs in life is that life is meant to be enjoyed. Life is not meant to be so hard. And that's what I felt on that corner. I was thinking when I thought enough, I thought it shouldn't have to be so hard. And that's when I, you know, I decided, okay, I talked to my husband. I was very fortunate that I could um, step down from my um, work at that time. And I took about a year and a half 
to really figure my stuff out. So tell me about the next chapter and what you've created with Happy Grace. Yeah. So I love the smile it brings to your face. You can see how proud you are. I am. I am. And I'm, I'm proud of it for so many reasons. I mean, one is any entrepreneur knows there is something so special about creating something out of nothing, right? You if, have an idea. Yeah. And like you have an idea. So I had this idea. I left um, the Phoenix Suns and I became an executive coach. And so for a couple of years, I was working one-on-one with really high level men and women. I was speaking all over the country and I was hearing the same thing over and over, Carrie. Um, The same struggles, you know, people would come to me and they'd say, well, I'd like to be a better leader. I'd like to be a better communicator. And we'd spend a couple of hours together and I'd find that they sounded a lot like the old me really wasn't about the communication. It really wasn't about the leadership. They wanted those things, but they wanted to feel better in some way, right? Because the reason they weren't communicating was because they didn't, they didn't feel confident. They had imposter syndrome, for example, right? And even so, the men, just even, to be clear, this is not clear. just a woman thing we're talking Absolutely about. Absolutely not. And that is one of the misconceptions that I think a lot of people have is that it's a female. It is not. I heard very similar things. And a lot of men even, um, who struggle with the same work-life balance, you know, which we think of as a woman's job. And to be clear, I do more of the meal planning, packing, <laughs> like, but But, you know, I would talk with men who were like, they don't want to miss their kids stuff. Right. They don't want to be an absentee father. And so it was really um, interesting. And so I had this aha moment. I was literally on a plane going on vacation, reading Town and Country magazine. And I was flipping through and I was seeing how we had all of these products for like, make yourself look beautiful, make your clothes look great, right? All of these things. But we didn't have anything to easily nourish our souls, to like work on ourselves. And I thought, I want everyone to have access to the tools and the method that people pay me thousands of dollars to learn. I want everyone to have access to that. And so I created a new entity, Happy Grace, um, created a line of products, and we're just like off and running. You're taking intentional thinking through a word, a phrase, a reminder, Mm -hmm. and you're putting those on note cards and and, and tell us a little more. Yeah, well, it's all, I mean, the GLOW method, that's my method. And so for anyone listening today who's like, okay, this resonates, but now what? The first thing I would say, gratitude. The fastest way to shift your, your feeling state is by just noticing what is working. Because it's not possible, Carrie, to be angry or unhappy when you are in a feeling place of gratitude. That is the number one thing. The second thing I would say is let go of what you can't control. And by the way, that is everything other than you. You control your feelings, thoughts, and actions. You don't control anyone else's. And the beauty of that is that that also means you are not responsible for their thoughts, feelings, and actions. Those two things alone are a great starting point. I could go on and on. Um, But uh, I guess the third thing I would say is that self-care. Be kind to yourself. I like to tell my clients, don't say anything to yourself. You would not say to a five-year-old little girl standing in front of you. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So when you when you work with your clients um, and you're very kind with your knowledge, you talk to people and you, you're on a journey of healing for yourself yeah. and for a lot of other people mm-hmm. as well. So when you talk to your clients and someone might be in the place where you were or have their own individual journey that's really tough, where do you, do you kind of have a place that you have them begin? Yeah, the first place is noticing. I always tell everyone, the fact that you're aware to it, start noticing. Noticing when you feel great. Noticing when you feel bad. Noticing when you're being unkind to yourself. Noticing what's happening is really the first step to creating change. Because once we know what's going on, Carrie, then we can say, okay, now we know where we need to create change. And I like to say, we're going to create micro shifts. We are not going to build Rome in a day, right? I became who I was over decades. You became who you... But if we can just make small shifts in the way we think and act each day over time, you create an entirely new life. What is your life like today? How do you feel? Awesome. It is... uh, I was just having coffee with a girlfriend before we came here, and I was telling her... I am doing everything I always wanted. I have a great relationship with my husband. I have a great relationship with my three kids, all very different relationships. I'm building a business, but I'm doing all of that because I feel good inside, 
right? It starts with me, and the rest of that has been, I guess, uncovered, but yeah. Did you get life. past the point of caring that you don't have the, even though you are the founder of your company, so you are the CEO, sure. but you don't have that title of, you know, from this corporation yeah. or that. Did you get over that? Absolutely. And here's the thing. Those things didn't make me any happier, you know, to people who think, oh, when I get the job, when I get the car, when I get the house, that thing will not make you feel any better, right? It's about loving who you are. And I love who I am more than I ever have. And through doing this, have you experienced, do you think, being able to heal your heart and some of the things that were tough for you growing up? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's huge. One of the stories that I shared, and I'm, I'm actually a pretty private person. I don't, this is way out of my comfort zone to talk about my own struggles, but I had a really rocky relationship with my dad, and um, he died unexpectedly in the last year. And one of the things I shared with my friends was that I, through this journey, my own self-healing, I had forgiven him and I never told him. And that is the thing that has stuck with me. And I think he knew it. Um, But I wanted to share that with other people because I feel like forgiveness is another one of those things that we have to do if we want to heal ourselves. And... um, And so, yeah, I mean, healing this journey has forced me to go back and look at a lot of things that needed to be addressed, but it's all good. And even though I hate crying, I hate tearing up in front of you. You're making me tear up. (laughs) I I don't like being vulnerable. That's the truth. I really don't like it. And I've spent most of my time trying not to do it. But my real healing, the joy that I feel now, has only come through that vulnerability. And just before we wrap, I just want to um, ask you, you know, what are your words of inspiration for people who try, who want to tap in? I mean, you were saying before we, we started the show that happiness is there. Yeah. How do we tap into it? it it's there. It is. I, the thing I would say is that it's always there, number one. Know that, right? You don't have to go out and create it, find it, make it. This is not another thing on your to-do list. It is right there for you. And I believe that the universe, God, whoever you, the greater power out there, wants you to be happy. I mean, that is what life is about. Is it about enjoyment? And so if you can do one thing for yourself today, one thing, and truly, if it's just that moment of gratitude, Carrie, where you say, you know what? I'm still breathing. I'm still breathing. Use that as a launching off point to start creating whatever your dream life is. It might not look like mine, might not look like yours, but whatever it is, you know, just try and ladder up each day to some higher level of energy and feeling. Well, I'm very grateful to be sitting here and uh, interviewing you. And boy, I feel like we could go have a couple glasses of wine after this and just talk for like six hours. (laughs) Thank you so so. much. And congratulations on what you have built and what you continue to build. I encourage people to go to happygrace.com and check out all the cool things that Tanya has going on. Tanya Willis, thank you so much. Thank you, Carrie. And thanks to all of you for joining us for Carrie Pena Reports. Today's show produced and engineered by Shannon Hernandez, brought to you by Inspired Me. Media 360. Until next time, stay inspired.